Welcome back to The Heat. Now that the United States and Cuba have restored diplomatic ties, what does it mean for other Latin American countries? Joining us now from New York is Eva Gollinger. She is an attorney, author, and commentator on Latin American affairs. Here with us in Washington, D.C. is Michael Shifter. He's the president of Inter-American Dialogue and a professor of Latin American studies at Georgetown University. And from Bangkok, we're joined by Pepe Escobar. He's a Brazilian journalist and a roving correspondent for the Asia Times. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Eva, let me start with you, and let's talk about the United States' relationship with Venezuela. The United States has called Venezuela a threat to U.S. national security. Sanctions have been imposed on a number of senior Venezuelan officials. Now, the U.S. has walked back some of those uh, actions that it took against Venezuela. So are we seeing a very ambivalent... Uh, policy here by the United States towards other countries in Latin America? Well, first of all, it's rather ironic that just as the U.S. is recognizing the failed policy against Cuba of imposing sanctions and a blockade for over 50 years, then they're turning around and doing it against Venezuela. And uh, also, the entire region rejected those U.S. sanctions. And that hostile, aggressive language that was used in Obama's executive decree that was issued in March of this year. So I do think uh, that certainly the U.S. has recognized that because of the pressure that that was put on their policy against Cuba, they were forced to change because of Latin America, amongst others in the U.S. as well. And the same is happening with Venezuela. Uh, and at the same time, you know, the Cubans in the negotiations and conversations with the United States government over the past few months have brought the issue of Venezuela into the talks. So it certainly is another point that's important in the ongoing dialogue and uh, opening of relations between the U.S. and Cuba is that the United States not pursue that type of aggressive policy against another Latin American country, and in this case, Venezuela. So I think we are going to see, you know, sort of a backtracking of that type of hostile policy, trying to impose sanctions, intervening in another country's affairs in Latin America uh, on the part of Washington. That has been an utter failure over the past half century and beyond. Uh, Pepe, I'm wondering if we are getting the full picture here of the United States' relationship with Latin America. For instance, you know, as Eva just pointed out, uh, there's been hostile language used against Venezuela, but at the same time, uh, U.S. officials have been meeting with their Venezuelan counterparts uh, in an effort to create, in the words of Secretary of State John Kerry, a normal relationship. Uh, is this another foreign policy reversal for the Obama administration? Have they come to realize that engagement is better than sanctions, than taking hostile actions against these countries? Well, the hostile actions, like I ever said, uh, they are not restricted to Venezuela at all. They are restricted to any Latin American power or middle power or even small power that dares to defy the Washington consensus or everything that emanates from that Texas, Washington, Wall Street. Don't forget that at the moment, there's a serious destabilization effort against Dilma Rousseff, the president of Brazil. Of course, there is the internal Brazilian dynamics. Uh, corruption, of course, uh, the fact that the economic policy of Dilma's government is not exactly brilliant. But at the same time, there is, uh, I would say, fifth column and Trojan horse uh, spectators and active spectators inside the Brazilian system that in conjunction with those famous NED-style American NGOs are actually trying to destabilize the government in Brazil. This happens in Argentina as well. This happened in um, uh, Bolivia a few years ago, actually a coup that in the end, at the last minute, was defused by the Morales government. Uh, there are always t tentatives against Ecuador as well. So in, in terms of the overall policy of any American administration, it can be Republican, be Democrat, this is a bipartisan thing. If you dare to defy the superpower, you're going to be in trouble. Michael, the public message out of the White House is that the policies of the past few decades have failed. The United States now needs to change its policies when it comes to Latin America. Uh, and we see that happening in Cuba. We see that happening in Venezuela as well. President Obama has appointed as his point man for Latin America, uh, Mark Fairstein. Um, he's a man not without controversy, especially for his role in Nicaragua. What do we know about him? And what does this tell us about the White House policy towards Latin America? 
Well, I think, first of all, uh, the, White, the White House policy towards Latin America is defined by President Obama. And he has his team that implements the decisions that are made in the White House. And he made the decision on Cuba. It was a bold decision. It was an important decision. It was a historic decision, as we're seeing today. And it has enormous uh, positive implications throughout Latin America. Uh, Mr. Fierstein is somebody whose who's, uh, background and record are clear. He's worked for uh, the uh, Agency for International Development. He's worked for the uh, National Democratic Institute. Um, in the past, he's done some work in polling, and so he has his background, and he was, he was selected as somebody from, went from AID to now the senior position uh, advising the president on Latin America. But the president uh, clearly makes, makes the decisions. He's made the decision on Venezuela, and he's managing that. And uh, I think it's moving in a positive direction, as the New York Times noted today. Let me ask you about Venezuela, because that's one of your areas of expertise. You've written widely about this. Its economy is in trouble right now. I mean, is it close to collapse? Because as you've written, uh, there are shortages in basic goods, uh, world-leading inflation, you call it, and rampant crime in the country. Well, the situation is terrible, uh, deteriorating rapidly, dramatically. Uh, poll numbers for the president, Maduro, are way down. Uh, there's an or according to all the surveys that we see, uh, the Venezuelans are extremely, extremely worried about the direction where the country is going. I think it's very hard to predict what's going to happen. No one's saying it's going to collapse. Uh, this is the wealthiest in terms of oil reserves. They have the, they have the wealthiest, uh, they have the vastest oil reserves in the world, and so that gives them a cushion. They have support from China as well, as we know, for a lot of financing, over $50 billion since 2005. So they do have some margin for maneuver, but the situation the, the, the decisions the government's made are, are really, really very, very troubling. Uh, the crime is out of control. There are shortages, people waiting online for hours for, to get access to basic goods. And so there's enormous discontent. Uh, the scenarios that one can think of can go in a lot of different directions. But what's clear is that there's a profound crisis, a social crisis, political crisis, an economic crisis. And in the best of scenarios, I think it's going to take a long time for Venezuela to get back on track. Eva, uh, when the Cuban foreign minister Bruno Rodriguez was here in Washington just a few weeks ago when the uh, Cuban embassy was reopened, uh, there was a news conference afterwards with Secretary of State John Kerry, and John Kerry thanked uh, whom he called U.S. friends in Latin America, whom he said had urged the United States many times over the decades to normalize relations with Cuba. And I'm wondering what role did other Latin American countries play in the restoration of diplomatic relations between Washington and Havana. Well, certainly a, a, an enormous role, and we saw that during the past uh, Summit of the Americas preceding this one that took place this year in Panama, that there was protest amongst all the other countries, and in fact, some countries, such as Ecuador, in the Summit of the Americas prior to this one, that was in, I believe it was in Cartagena, refused to even attend if Cuba was still going to continue to be um, exiled from the Organization of American States because of U.S. pressure. So, you know, and it, it basically had become um, a, a non-issue for most other countries in, in Latin America that, look, we're, we're associating with Cuba. We've formed now uh, the community of Latin American and Caribbean states, the CELAC, which includes Cuba and does not include the United States and Canada, because we're a unified region and are going to have this type of relationship that's integrated and, you know, powerful uh, on a regional level, despite what U.S. policy has been throughout the past more than half a century. Pepe, regime change, is that the only ultimate goal as far as the United States is concerned? Uh, no, there won't, like Eva said, uh, it, there's, there won't be a change of policy at all. First of all, because Latin America for the Obama administration of, and for the next occupant of the White House is a minor problem compared to the really, really, really <laughs> headaches and nightmares that they have in terms of the pivoting to Asia, uh, containing Russia and China at the same time, which is official policy in any administration and the Pentagon, and try to extricate themselves of their self-created mass in the Middle East. So this minor diplomatic su success, if we uh, understand it uh, like this at the moment, assuming uh, they will treat uh, 
st start to treat Cuba as a normalized country, the American way. We still don't think this is going to happen. There will be the tentatives of, uh, I would say, a slow motion regime change process inside Cuba by American agents and by Cuban American agents. This is a fact for the next few years, for sure. Michael, the changes uh, adopted by the United States, is it driven in part by a changing world? I mean, we see China now having more influence in Latin America, in the Caribbean, in Central America as well. Uh, China's trade with the countries of this region is increasing, influence is raising. In a sense, as Washington decided, we've got to play catch up right now. Well, I think uh, they see w what's happening and they see that their influence has, has declined. I mean, partly because they're preoccupied distracted. Uh, there are other crises and challenges in the world that consume most of the attention, including obviously with the Secretary of State. Uh, Latin America is not a high priority. Uh, and, uh, and of course, there have been crises in the United States, economic crisis, and then two wars, draining wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, and China has a very aggressive strategy, uh, economic strategy in Latin America. There's no question about it. The United States is trying to pick some opportunities where it can really uh, get back in the game, regain some leverage, some influence. Uh, Cuba is clearly an important part of that, but it doesn't mean that the United States is uh, fully engaged with Latin America. Uh, it has to do a lot more on the economic front, on political front, diplomatic front. And uh, clearly, I think what this does, the change shift in uh, Cuba policies, opens up opportunities uh, for more engagement uh, with the region. We'll see if the United States is able to follow through on that. I think uh, there are, it's going to have to pick its, its issues and its countries, uh, but it's clearly not going to be able to match China in terms of the scale of investment and infrastructure, the scale of financing. The United States is simply not going to do that. They can't do that. So they have to play a different game. And uh, now I think Cuba is very, very positive in that respect. It's been applauded throughout Latin America. I think President Obama made a, made a good decision, a bold decision. And I think it does open up a lot and creates potential. We'll see now if the United States is really committed to following through. Right, and Eva, uh, looking at the relationship with Cuba right now, uh, the embargo still remains in place, as you've pointed out. Do you expect to see any significant progress on lifting that embargo in the near future? That's not in the hands of President Obama, as we know. It's in the hands of Congress. Certainly, and it's a debate that's happening now in the country. I mean, overwhelmingly, uh, U.S. citizens are in favor of lifting that embargo. Many of them didn't even understand what it was for and, and that it was still in place and that, it, you know, in the end, it limits um, U.S. citizen rights over everything else. I mean, of course, it's caused millions and millions of dollars in damage to the Cuban economy. And recently, in fact, yesterday on his birthday, uh, Fidel Castro called for the United States to pay reparations for what has been those extensive of damages caused to their economy and their country throughout the last 54 years of that blockade and, you know, causing them all this financial difficulty because of the fact that it's not just limit the, the blockade didn't just impede trade with the United States. It impeded also other countries that wanted to engage in different kinds of commercial activities with Cuba. You know, the U.S. would impose fines on countries that would uh, sell things to Cuba and then want to come to the United States. So, I mean, it, it had far-reaching repercussions. Pepe, given that the blockade is still in place, what are the potential areas for the greatest cooperation between Cuba and the United States? We've already seen cooperation in the medical field and to some extent in controlling the environment. Well, I would say that uh, in the medium to uh, short to medium term will be tourism, in fact. Uh, everybody from all over the world, you know, European tourists, Latin American tourists, uh, Asian tourists, in fact, they've been going to, to Cuba for quite a while, for a few years now. Uh, it's absolutely normal to, to see tourists from all over the world in Cuba, except America. So they could help. Uh, I, w I, I would not see like tomorrow uh, having uh, the Marriott and Ritz Carlton building uh, hotels in Cuba with uh, adjoining casinos like they were back to Cuba in 1959. No, this is not going to happen. But uh, American tourism certainly could. Uh, uh, in, t in terms of transfer of technology, I doubt it. Uh, uh, Cuba can have much better deals dealing, for instance, with Brazilian companies, with uh, Russian investment, with Chinese investment. and. Uh, not necessarily from uh, fr from the U.S. and uh, transfer of American uh, info technology, IT technology, maybe 
this, uh, for instance, uh, fiber optics uh, uh, connecting the whole of Cuba. Uh, if the Chinese don't do it, the Americans could possibly do it. So, so but, you know, but this, in, in terms of uh, trade with Cuba, I would say the best opportunities are with Chinese companies, European companies, and Brazilian companies. Michael, there was an interesting Pew Research uh, poll that was done on what kind of support there was in Latin America for the reopening of uh, relations with Cuba. 77% support among a range of Latin American countries, including Argentina, Chile, Venezuela, Brazil, and Mexico. And given that kind of public sentiment, how does the United States capitalize on that? Well, there's the same sentiment is reflected in polls in the United States. Uh, there's broad support for the decision to move forward. It's simply not an issue, and I don't think it's going to be an issue. In, it may be an issue in the Republican primary, but it's not going to be an issue in the general election. The polls are overwhelmingly in favor of this. But it's not. It's simply not. A, it's gone away as an issue. And in Latin America, this is again creates the, the the fact that this is something. This has been the main irritant in U.S. Latin American relations for decades. And while it's true that the embargo is still in place, it's true that Guantanamo was still an issue, and there are other issues that are there. The fact is that this is going to move forward. I think it's going to be very hard to reverse, and that really takes away one of the main obstacles to more productive relations with the U.S. and Latin America. 